Good day, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. I greet you in the name of the Triune God, our Father, the Son, the Word, the Living Word, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And what an amazing God we praise. And we have to know that this God is a living God, is a personal God, is involved in our lives. And how amazing, absolutely amazing is the, the gospel, um, the good news. How good is the good news? And my prayer today is that we may all become aware of the fullness of the glory and of the beauty and of the absolute goodness of the gospel that we have received, that God has revealed to us and given to us. And may we enjoy also today as we read in scripture, as we listen to his voice, may we, um, God, open our hearts and our minds to receive the fullness of the glory of the good news. Let us pray together. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us the wonderful gift of the good news of the gospel revealed through Jesus Christ and that you make it a living reality through the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we may receive it and we may enjoy the gift the free gift of your grace and your mercy that you um, share with us, that you want to um, make us part of the wonderful uh, mission of the kingdom of God, to acknowledge your reign, your absolute reign as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and to long, Lord, for the fulfillment of your vision and your mission with us as human beings, as humanity on earth, with the whole creation to lead us and to bring us to the fullness of your glory and your plan. Lord, we thank you that we may listen and we may have a conversation and we may have a relationship with the living God. This is too big for our comprehension. Lord, this gift is too wonderful to proclaim or to understand. Uh, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, as a Sunday, is set aside for our offerings, especially for the offerings at the door to go to the Institute for the Deaf. And therefore, I'd like to focus on um, being crippled in one or disabled in some or other way. I don't think, and I don't want to focus only on one specific kind of disability, but there are so many different kinds. And of course, um, we know that these people often live amongst us and with so much hardship and so much more to endure, to overcome and to live and to make a living. Um, it's so much harder for them than for people who do not have disabilities. And we are so thankful for health and if we can um, be and live full lives. Um, and therefore I would like to read in our scripture um, the chapter in Luke chapter 18 from verse 35 to verse 42. Luke 18. And the heading is a blind beggar receives his sight. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside, begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him 
Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Now I would like us just to reimagine um, what was going on in this man's um, heart. Um, as he was sitting there, as he probably was doing every day, sitting next to the road, begging. That was his life. Um, and asking for people's mercy and for an, uh, something to give them was part of uh, probably the only thing that he was able to do. I think nowadays um, blind and deaf and disabled people are much more enabled um, through many different uh, initiatives to help them, to help themselves. But in those days, if you were disabled, you were absolutely um, dependent on other people's grace and mercy and caring for you. And probably it wasn't much. It was just to come by. It was just to, to live. And what a kind of living that must be. Um, what a half... Um, sense of halfness, of not, not being full and fully a human and fully alive. Especially when you hear other people um, busy with their lives and laughing and, and doing stuff. And you are excluded. You can just sit at the side of the road. It must be absolutely terrible. A terrible kind of life. And then this man, on this day, hears that something is going on. There's something happening. There's a crowd and there's excitement, there's noise. Um, and not being able to see and to participate, um, just wondering what, what are the people doing, being excluded from that, but wanting to know what is happening there. It's not happening to me. I'm sitting here in the corner, but I'm just interested in what, what you are busy doing in your lives, just to maybe um, have a kind of imaginal um, journey in, in being part of it. And when the people tell him that it is Jesus, now he obviously has heard the name Jesus. He has heard of this person because he calls him immediately son of David. Um, so he also had an opinion about Jesus, about who he is. Um, now when the people told him, Jesus is passing by. <laughs> I think this is not something strange to him. Many people passes by, or passed him by, walked past him and didn't notice him, didn't give him anything. People just go on, they pass by. But here comes a person called Jesus and people are saying that he is also passing by. But for some reason, this man said, this cannot happen. Um, it, it made me think of somebody who I recently read um, survived on his surfboard for a couple of days 
and how he um, uh, explained how it felt when he heard airplanes coming and going and boats coming and going, but they didn't realize, they didn't recognize, they didn't see him. They just passed by to the point that he eventually gave up and knew that it would have been his last life, uh, last night before eventually a boat saw him and stopped and picked him up. Um, the experience of people passing you by. But then this man calls out, Jesus, son of David. Now, the reason why he calls Jesus the son of David um, is because David, uh, it, of course, it is a prophecy from the Old Testament that the son of David will come. It was this expectation of the Messiah. So he um, implies that, that Jesus um, is the Messiah. But what was especially interesting or um, noteworthy of the reign of King David was that he was the kind of king that served people, that didn't pass by. He wasn't the one who was only sitting on the throne in the, in, in, in the palace and he didn't care. He cared for the least in the society. He cared and he was there for those who are on the perimeters of life. And therefore, when Jesus, when he calls out to Jesus, he calls him the son of David with the expectation that he will be like David. And he will not be like the other people, even the Pharisees who, who just pass him by. And Jesus pick up on this and he stop. And he is brought to Jesus. And then the, the question that Jesus asked, which reveals him as the son of David, as being the one who cares. What can I do for you? Jesus wants to help this man. Jesus wants not to pass him by. And the wonderful uh, full thing is, and, and it's um, not very hard for this man to put his finger on it, to say immediately and definitely what it is that he wants Jesus to do for him. He wants to see. And uh, Jesus gives him this immediately. It's almost as if, yes, by all means, have your sight, see. Um, and knowing how uh, crucial and how much this must have affected this man's life. But to Jesus, this wasn't the high light. It wasn't the, the, the high point of what he came for. It's as if Jesus is referring to doing this as an everyday thing. Um, we read through the scriptures and we see many miracles. We see many times that Jesus heals people and casts out devils and demons. And, but that is not the main thing of Jesus' ministry. It's almost as if it is, and I want you to hear me correctly, it's not that I'm downplaying the wonder of the difference that um, being healed from a disability makes in someone's life. It is phenomenal for that person. But for Jesus' ministry, the crucial point lies deeper than that. It's almost as if a physical healing is like a, a shadow of the real healing that Jesus came for. Now, being blind, especially, is a, a metaphor that Jesus uses to describe what and for what he came for um, to human beings, to, to earth, to live amongst us, to die for us and to be resurrected. And, and then the Bible often refers to that Many people who see, who is not able to be able to see physically, but who are blind emotionally. 
and spiritually. And that that is a bigger blindness. It's a bigger um, uh, disability than a physical blindness. Being blind to see what we as healthy human beings need Jesus for. Now, why this is relevant for me is that I often get into conversations where, where, where we have this experience of we love Jesus and we love the gospel, but the relevance of the gospel almost has lost its grip. And, and we experience in the times that we live in that it is more real, a uh, bigger reality for more people that Jesus is not the, the focus, it's not so important, it's not some, somebody that we call out to, that we yearn for. It is almost just a part of life and a part of our culture and a part of our spiritual life. And the Bible warns us, definitely, not to be blind for our need for Jesus. Um, now, before we go to some other text verse, um, the, the call of this beggar, of this blind man, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. There are different translations on this uh, wording of having mercy on me. Um, it is also translated as have pity on me or deal kindly with me. The Afrikaans um, uh, expresses it more like in, uh, to embrace me. Om arm mij. It is as if you, it's not only having mercy and forgiving sins, but, but seeing and to acknowledge the pain and to deal with it kindly. It's a specific way that this man wants Jesus to deal with him. And this is what we as as people um, see in Jesus. It's not only that he is a healer, that he is able to do, but the way Jesus do things. That he does it kindly, lovingly, caringly. That is the beauty, the absolute wonderful beauty of Jesus. It's not just passing by, not just um, like in healing left and right, but he attends to the person, the inner need of the person. Now coming back to um, spiritual blindness, um, in Acts chapter 28 verse 26, uh, where this says um, that this generation and this people um, they will hear and they will listen and they will listen and still they will not hear. And they will look, but still they will not receive what they see. It's a spiritual blindness. And, and even Jesus referred to the Pharisees at a time in John that chapter 9, verse 39 to 41, where Jesus um, tells them about um, being blind. And then they reply, but we are not blind. Because they don't realize they are blind. They think they see. And then in Revelation 3 verse 17, and I'm going to read it for us. Um, Where we get the same idea, and yet it is to the people living in Laodicea, um, where this community is um, very wealthy, and they've got everything going their way. They, they are rich, they are 
healthy and they prosperous. And then Jesus says to them, as well as he said to the Pharisees, You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth. And do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. See, blindness, spiritual blindness is not being able to realize your own pettiness, your own blindness, your own poorness and being wretched. But of what? And, and I think we're living in such times today that people have relatively have acquired a lot in life. We don't need to be rich to experience a sense of accomplishment, of life is full of things and life is at, that you have more than enough to make life seem good, seem enough. And, and therefore, if Jesus would walk past you in such a setting, in such a time, um, and you would hear Jesus coming, would you call out to him? Would you have the need to call out to the son of David? Or, or even if he comes by and you'd stop on his own and say, listen, I see you here. What can I do for you? To say, and I think many people, I even think many Christians today would say, no, I can't really think of something. I've, I'm pretty much well, thank you. I've got everything that I need. My life is full and I am, I'm happy and no, I, I'm fine. Thank you, Jesus. I don't need anything from you. I, I think many people misses this opportunity of Jesus, of God, passing by us on a daily basis. But we don't reach out because we don't feel the need to reach out to him. But this was very different for somebody that we read in the Bible. And this is Paul. And I would like us to refer to the last text. And it is in Romans 7, um, verse 24, where he exclaims. Now, just picture Paul. Paul, a very dynamic person, a person who has got a dynamic personality and ministry and um, of course he has a lot of hardships through it as well but I don't think he minds that as much. I, I think his ministry and um, being able to live and to work for the Lord is, is so overwhelming to him. Um, but in Romans 7 he exclaims Listen, listen to this. Wretched and miserable man that I am. This is Paul speaking here. Wretched and miserable man that I am. What on earth is Paul talking about? How is he and does he experience himself as being rich? He is blessed. He is having a wonderful ministry. But then he goes on in, in explaining what he means. Who will rescue me and set me free from this corrupt and mortal existence? Who will rescue me and set me free 
of this corrupt and mortal existence. Now what Paul is referring here to is an experience of his own sinful nature. He even calls it in this text that what I want to do, this I seem not be able to get it right. I do not do that. What I don't want to do, that is exactly what I end up doing. And then he exclaims this. This is a wretched and miserable existence. Existence in a kind of slavery of the nature of humankind, of humanity, falling so much short of the glory of God. Now, the question arises, how did Paul realize this? If we acknowledge that in Jesus' time, many people, uh, in Paul's time, in the early church, many people did not realize this. And the Pharisees did not realize this. The people in Laodicea did not realize this. How come Paul realizes? What does what um, brought Paul to the point to realize and to exclaim this? That he is rich and miserable man. And ironically, he first had to become blind for a little while before he could open his eyes, before he could really see the glory of God, before he could really understand how miserable and wretched he is. Um, now, of, it's not that it's, Paul stops there. Um, he doesn't remain in this miserable life because he exclaims after this that um, blessed um, be to God, to Jesus, because he do, and he is the only one, the only one who do not pass by, but who stops and the only one who can heal my blindness, my spiritual blindness, who is the only one who can save me from this wretched life, of being a wretched man and a meaningless existence. Jesus alone can give me meaning and life. But how did he come to realize it? Now, in Romans chapter 7, go and read the whole chapter. Um, Paul refers to the law. Um, and of course, it refers to the, the Ten Commandments um, that we read in uh, Exodus 20. But I would like to just elaborate on this. Because I don't think it's only... Um, the Ten Commandments that Paul refers to. It's not only the law, because, and I think we need to be very realistic and we need to be very honest when we say this. Um, and, and I will put myself here in, in the shoes of um, what I also hear many people say when I talk to them. And that is that when you only read the law, that you have a sense of, okay, that's okay, I, I can do this, I, I, don't, I haven't murdered anybody and I haven't do that, done that. And it's not that complicated, it's not that hard. But it becomes much harder when Jesus describes what is meant by the Ten Commandments in the Sermon on the Mount. And, and all of a sudden it becomes, Ish, I, I know that I struggle a little bit with this and I struggle with that. No, I'm not perfect. And Okay, but I'm not perfect. But that's not too bad, is it? Knowing that I have a little sin, knowing that I... Uh, struggle a little bit, it's fine. I, um, I can deal with that. So it's not only the law in itself that brings us to the point of realizing our wretchedness. It needs to be combined with 
an absolute impression of the goodness and the glory and the beauty of God and a desire to share in His glory and in His majesty, a desire to be part and to participate and knowing that the only way that we can participate in God's glory is to rid ourselves from sin. And that is Paul's problem. He said, I so desperately want this, but I struggle in myself. I'm a wretched man. I cannot do it. So it's not only the law in essence alone. It's a law as an instrument of understanding and getting to know that if we want to participate in the glory of God, we are wretched. We are in a corrupt and mortal existence. But the exclamation, the celebration of Paul is to say that Jesus, as for the blind man, Jesus deals with us kindly. Jesus um, stops for, for us. He stops at the on the cross he dies for us to to give us his mercy fully so that we can share in the glory of god we as believers as followers of christ as people who desire with our whole being to share in the glory and the majesty of god we need to understand, we need to open our eyes, we need to see and to realize our richness, our neediness. We need to realize that this is us, not only the crippled people, not only those who did with disabilities, but we are disabled by sin and we need the pity we need the, um, the healing touch of mercy of Jesus. We need it. Without it, we are lost. Without it, we are living a, uh, a mortal and a corrupt existence. And we need, as a church, we need to help our brothers and sisters to realize and to understand and to help them to open their eyes to see how even if they are rich, even if they've got everything, even if they have wonderful lives, to realize that that is not our hope. We need Jesus. Let us pray. Thank you, Jesus, that we may come to you. And Lord, we call out to you as the son of David, because you are the God, you are the one, the Messiah, who came to rule. But do not be a ruler who passes by, but the ruler who stops and who... Um, extends your love and your compassion and your pity to the very least in society, to even to us. But Lord, help us to realize just how rich and how much we need you. And Lord, we pray that you will forgive us when we think that we we are okay. And that our petty sins are not as problematic. But Lord, standing before your face and um, before your glory and coming to realize the absolute beauty of who you are. Lord, we fall so 
far short. And with Paul, Lord, we as a church come to acknowledge and to pray and to ask that you will have mercy on us. And that we will cling to you, that we will cling to the cross every day because we cannot let go. As that man on the surfboard hanging on for dear life on the surfboard, waiting for someone to pick them up. Lord, so we, we um, hold on, floating on the sea, but holding on to the cross alone. For Lord, and therefore we want to praise you as this blind man, after you have healed him, Lord, we praise you, we thank you, we want to follow you, we want to serve you, we want to be your disciples. We celebrate and we praise your name, for you are the only Saviour. Amen. Brother and sister, I pray that we have, God will just open our eyes to see and to experience and to enjoy the beauty of the gospel and of the good news and of the words that God has sent and given us to reveal to us how good he is for us. And I pray may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, will be with you and me. Amen.